I think our ability to really connect you with anyone in the world that you need to sort of unlock something in your business is, is pretty unparalleled. in a wonderful mood. Happy Tuesday, everybody, and welcome to episode nine of Venturing in VC. This is a live show where we speak with top venture capitalists about their routines, journeys, and lessons. You can sign up for exciting guests every single Tuesday at inside.com slash VIVC. This episode is also going to go live on Thursday on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. So if you really enjoy the conversation as much as I'm going to enjoy it today, uh, please make sure to share it with your friends, peers, um, everybody, even family members. And um, today we have a very special guest for episode nine. Um, and for all of Venturing in VC, we've had awesome guests, but this one I'm very, very excited for, especially excited for. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Mike Vernal, who is a partner at Sequoia Capital, one of the oldest and most respected VC funds in the Valley. Prior to Venture, he spent eight years at Facebook as a VP of product and engineering, leading multiple teams. And also, he spent four years at Microsoft as a PM. Before we invite him to the stage, I want to say thank you so much to our sponsor for the entirety of season one of Venturing in VC, Seed Invest. Seed Invest is the equity crowdfunding platform that is helping so many entrepreneurs raise the capital they need from the seed stage to series D by harnessing the awesome power of the crowd. You can learn more about how to get your business in front of their network of over 600,000 investors at inside.seedinvest.com. All right, without further ado, we're going to welcome Mike to the stage. Mike, happy Tuesday. Uh, happy Tuesday. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. I'm very excited for this episode, if you couldn't tell. So I just want to say thank you so much uh, to you for uh, spending some time with us today. Of course. I, my pleasure to be here. Sweet. Um, so, Mike, before we get to your time at Sequoia, obviously, I want to talk about your uh, prior experiences. But before we even get there, um, I understand that you never expected yourself to be doing venture. So I'm curious, when you were a kid, what was your dream job? Oh, um... <laughs> I don't know what my, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think I wanted to be a lawyer. I almost don't remember anymore, but uh, I, I think I like to argue. And uh, I think being a lawyer seemed like a glamorous job when I was, when I was growing up. Like I, I imagined like in the style of Perry Mason or like arguing in front of uh, the Supreme Court. Um, I, I did not, I did not end up going down that path, but I think that was probably my, my dream when I was like, you know, 10 years old or something. Of course. Well, similar to capital allocators, lawyers are in the uh, value creation business. So, I mean, it's awesome to see that you're bringing a lot of value today. Um, so now, Mike, I'd love to get into your time. Uh, we'll begin and talk about your time um, at Microsoft. You know, you spent four years as a PM at Microsoft. What was one routine that you developed uh, during your time at Microsoft uh, that really helped you continue um, within the professional, um, your professional journey? Um. I think one thing that ended up being, uh, you know, Microsoft was a wonderful place. I was there uh, in the 2000s and it was a very large company at the time. It was probably 100,000 plus people. Um, <clears throat> and I think one of the things that uh, I was I was lucky enough to do, I, I don't know how much it was self-directed, but I, I got to know a lot of wonderful people across a bunch of the different groups within Microsoft. Um, you know, I, I worked on... Uh, I worked on the .NET framework and a bunch of developer tools, but I got to know people in Windows. I got to know people in Office. I got to know people um, kind of across the company. And those uh, those relationships have paid dividends uh, for 20 years. Uh, actually, there was a bunch of those folks who eventually ended up joining, joining me at Facebook. So there's a lot of um, people that I helped hire into Facebook and are now execs at the company. Uh, I actually meet founders. Uh, there have been a handful of times in the past year that I've met founders that I first worked with 20 years ago when I was straight out of wow. college. So it is a, it is definitely a small world, but um, I think just getting to know as many people as I could across the entire company was super valuable at the time. 
Yeah, I think um, I relate to a lot of the things that you said because my generation, you know, we're no longer really interested in these one-off relationships. You know, it's more focused on the quality these days instead of the quantity of your network. Um, so it's great when you know a lot of people, but of course, you know, it's great when you know that those relationships can turn into long-term um, partnerships even. Uh, so it's really cool to hear that a lot of those people at Microsoft would, of course, be able to work with you at Facebook and uh, further along your career. So perfect transition for us to talk about Facebook. Um, you were the vice president of products and engineering. This was the most exciting and most stressful time in your career. Um, so let's start there. What made it the most exciting and most stressful? I can guess there's probably a few things, but if you were to kind of weed out the top three things that um, created that experience for you at Facebook. Um, yeah, well, I was lucky enough. I, I joined uh, when the company was still relatively small. Uh, I probably index on all the people that were there before me versus after me. But when I uh, when I joined, it was probably a few hundred people. I think it was around 80 people in engineering or so. And um, it was, um, you know, it was a company that was working in the sense that like it was growing. It was growing at a pretty consistent clip week over week, but it was not working um, just due to its own devices, it was working because people were kind of working around the clock trying to sort of um, just keep up with that growth. Sometimes now at Sequoia, when we, we meet a company like this, uh, we sometimes talk about it as like the founder has a tiger by the tail in the sense that there's a thing that is just running and you're doing your best to keep up with it. Uh, and I think that was that was very much the case in the early days. Like the 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 company, the business had a ton of momentum, but there was also a ton that we were constantly doing just to sort of keep up with the growth. Um, you know, there's this engineering adage that basically every time you get to like the next 10x level of scale, you kind of have to just completely redo the system because the kind of system you design for one level of scale is just the wrong system for two levels higher. Um, and so there was a lot of just, you know, people sometimes talked about it as like rebuilding the airplane in flight, whatever sort of, uh, analogy you want to use, there is a lot of that for probably two, three, four years. Of course. Um, so we're going to get, of course, eventually to your advice for founders, but how did you um, really find, um, you know, working in a hyper growth company? What's some advice you kind of gave yourself and figured out along uh, that journey? Um, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I, I would have had advice for myself at the time with the benefit of hindsight. Um, one piece of advice I generally give people um, that are thinking about their next step in their career is one, to join, you know, Sheryl Sandberg has this famous line about someone that offers you a seat on a rocket ship, you don't ask which seat. I, I do <laughs> think like if there is a, um, if there is a company that is clearly breaking out and is, um, shows the signs of being a rocket ship, first, I would prioritize joining that. And then two, uh, once you're there, I would just try to get involved with the most important problems, the most important, uh, whatever is most important for the company. Um, and I'd give one layer on top of that, which is I would work on the thing that is most important and also um, also most urgent, um, like something that has a lot of energy, but is also moving quickly and is shipping and has like a real feedback loop. Um, and so, you know, I, I was lucky in that when I joined Facebook, I ended up working on what at the time were some of the most important problems inside of the company. And that it has a bunch of nice benefits. One is you, you kind of get to the heart of the company pretty quickly to if a company is good at resource allocation, it will try to put its best people on its most important problems. And so you get to know the, uh, sort of great people inside the company. So all those things together, I think are really valuable. Of course, I love your point on prioritization as well, because there are so many, especially at a hyper growth startup, you got to put out this fire, you got to work on this, you got to tend to this. Um, since you had opportunities to lead various teams uh, with a lot of responsibility at Facebook, what advice did you give to your team members uh, when it came to prioritization? And did you guys use any tools to help prioritize your time like OKRs or kind of what were the, uh, what were the um, you know, insights that you had when it came to um, helping others prioritize their time? Yeah, I was a big, um, I think one philosophy that really originated in the growth team at Facebook, but then really permeated the entire company was 
um, you know, I think the poster said focus on impact. And so uh, uh, that was very much a value inside the company. And, and the uh, I was a big believer. So I'm, I'm a big believer in two things. One is I'm a, a believer in uh, what I would, what Amazon calls single threaded teams, mm -hmm. which is basically having a team that has a singular purpose. And then two, I'm a big believer in, in most cases, especially in like one to N teams, less so in zero to one teams and one to N teams of having kind of a singular goal and a singular, met a singular metric to focus on. Um, and I think you know, one of my observations was that the teams that were really dialed in, that like really understood why they existed, what their goal was, uh, what their metric was, understood the drivers of um, of the business. Those were the ones that operated really well. And I think there were there were other teams that had um, uh, where it was just like a little bit more loosey goosey, where you know it was kind of like there are lots of things that seemed like they could be good to do because someone wanted them. Um, I think were less high performance, and so I, I, um, I really became a convert to having teams with a single goal, a single metric, and uh, uh, a culture of always wanting to sort of maximize their impact on on that goal and that metric. Of course. Yeah. Focus is crucial in those early days. Um, I love that you brought up Amazon's philosophy, single threaded leadership, because um, I did have a chance to read um, Working Backwards. That's a great book for anybody that wants to learn more about that philosophy, because it is true. I mean, if you have a singular goal that you can focus on, um, you can make some really big magic happen. And if you have so many other things that you have to focus on, I mean, it's kind of like the master of one versus the master of none. I mean, you know, you're going to be able to be diverse than a lot of cool things, a lot of different things. But, um, you know, if you're able to focus on one thing and almost obsess over that, um, you'll be able to make some really big impact. Um, so now, Mike, I'd love to transition into speaking about your time at Sequoia. Um, I'd love for you to kind of, um, you know, get the conversation started with talking about how you found out about an opportunity at Sequoia after your time working at companies like Microsoft and Facebook. Yeah. Um, like I think you mentioned in the beginning, I didn't... Um... Uh, I didn't know that much about VC. I didn't aspire to be a VC. Uh, it wasn't uh, sort of high on my plate. Um, I uh, So I first met Sequoia um, through sort of two, two different people. One is uh, a good friend of mine who was uh, one of my roommates in college. Uh, he worked at Apple for a number of years, and then he ended up starting a company called Inkling that uh, Sequoia led the Series A in. Brian Schreier, in particular, led the Series A in. And so... Um, I knew Matt super well. Matt knew Brian really well. At some point, Matt sort of as good sort of matchmakers or networkers do said, the two of you should get to know each other. So I got to know Brian uh, via that. I also got to know, um, or rather, uh, another good friend who I worked with at Microsoft, again, back to the getting to know good people at Microsoft. Uh, I worked with uh, someone named Steve Garrity, who founded a different company called Hearsay, which Sequoia also led the Series A in. Brian was also the board member. And so I, I got introduced to Brian through a, a few different channels, and um, kind of one thing led to another. Um, uh, yeah. That's another perfect example of cultivating uh, long-term relationships as well, because you never know where those can end up. Um, so let's talk about your role at Sequoia. Uh, first question I have for you is, how have you found the um, most effective way to build trust with founders? Um, that's a good question. I um, Everyone has their own style. Um, my style... Uh, is I, I try to be pretty, um, first, I, I try to like really understand uh, their their product, their business, their motivations. I just try to dive in and, and understand the product as well as I can. Uh, and I, I think sometimes, uh, one, founders are looking for someone who kind of gets it and asks good questions versus bad questions. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I intentionally try to ask good questions, but I, I do try to uh, hopefully ask good questions. Uh, so I think that helps too. I try, I mean, no one is, uh, no one is perfect, least alone me, but I try um, to just kind of speak my mind and give honest feedback, both like before we, we might invest, but also after, I mean, 
but also, I mean, it's easier afterwards, but actually it's a little bit harder beforehand. Um, and so, you know, if I'm saying no, I try to explain the real rationale versus some like, sorry, it's just not for us kind of uh, opaque answer. Um, and then I, I sort of hope that those things pay off over the long term. So, Of course. Um, so not only is this series for emerging uh, capital allocators, you know, that want to be able to reach levels like yours one day, but also we want to be able to give founders, you know, the best advice that they need as well. Um, let's break down the pitch. You know, what for you, I know the common question is going to be, you know, like what is and what makes a great pitch? Uh, but let's flip it. Let's turn that question on its head. You know, what, what are some pitches and you don't obviously need to get into specifics with companies, but um, that you just know right away that you're not interested in investing in that company? You know, what really makes a bad pitch? Hmm. Um, a few, uh, sort of a few different ideas. One is like, if I, if I literally can't figure out what you're doing or what you're building, uh, that is a bad pitch. Uh, th that might sound uh, that might sound like a joke, but there are actually like there aren't that many, but there are definitely. I can remember probably a couple of dozen pitches over time where, at the end of the meeting, I still didn't actually know what the company did, um, oh. and sometimes it's. Um, I, I think there is you know there's a different explanation in each case, but I, I do think sometimes founders try to be um, kind of like highfalutin or buzzwordy as opposed to just plain spoken. I think being plain spoken is always better. Like, uh, I mean, people sometimes make jokes, you know, there is, there is a, there are periods of time where like every pitch needs to invoke, you know, AI or machine learning or blockchain or like local social mobile or whatever the, like the buzzwords of the time are. And there have definitely been pitches in the past where it's like, this is a dog food company. Why does it need to be on the blockchain? Um, um, so uh, th I think that would be one. I think there's a, um, we like the, I think there's a fine balance to strike between you, as a founder, you want to explain who you are and your background and your founding story and why you are the right person to build a company um, while also really heavily using the we word versus the I word and um, not, you know, sometimes people spend 30 minutes introducing themselves and their background. That's too long. <laughs> 10 seconds is probably too short. You want to get like a, a nice dialed in one to two minute background on who you are and like why you are the best person to build this company. Um, uh, and, and that's, you know, it's usually like a tight two, two and a half minutes. So, of course. Yeah. I think you've mentioned a lot of great points. Um, when it gets down to it, you know, just get to the point. I mean, that's really like what, uh, the advice is, you know, for, uh, founders, a lot of times that they want to pitch, you know, they want to just give in way too much information, but I think it's best to simplify things sometimes and just really put them on face value and like what you really want to communicate and get across, um, the table, um, is what you should say instead of just beating around the bush and kind of <laughs> jumping all over the place. Um, so on the other end, you know, for the young investors at Sequoia, um, that are learning about these new trends and uh, you know new industries um, based off of the pitches that come in. Um, how what advice do you give to them when it comes to simplifying information? Um, and afterwards, you know, after a good pitch, learning a little more about that company before making a final decision. Good question. The I think one of the core jobs, uh, one of the core jobs of an investor early in the process, especially right before or right after you meet a company for the first time, is trying to get to the first order questions. Like, what are the most important questions to answer? Mm -hmm. And like, it, you know, if you, if you meet a company, depending on your level of knowledge of the space, you could literally have dozens, if not hundreds of possible questions. Like right before this, I was on an email thread where we were talking about a company and someone shared, well, these were like, these are the questions the, the team had and there were like 17 questions or something like that. Um, and I, I think one of the most important skills is just being able to get to like, what are the first order questions? What are the two or three questions that really, really matter here? Um, and um, that's, I think that's a little bit of a skill that just comes with experience. Like, um, 
you know, my partner, Doug Leone, is fantastic at this. Like he can listen to a business and get to the heart of like, these are the two questions that matter. Often it is some function of um, how big the market is or what does the sales motion look like or what have you. But um, uh, I think for a lot of new investors, that's a skill that you develop pretty quickly is just how do you get to the heart of the issue? Of course. Um, so I'd love to pivot now, Mike, and dive into um, some of the resources that you believe founders get um, and overall the value that they get um, you know, from becoming a part of the Sequoia portfolio. Um, so we'll start there. And then afterwards, we're going to talk about uh, this new reimagined uh, Sequoia Fund um, announcement that was made a few months ago. But uh, to start, um, you know, what is that pitch that you get? Because not only do founders have to pitch Sequoia, Sequoia, of course, has to pitch founders as well. Uh, so what is that pitch that you usually give um, to founders? Yeah, it's it's. I don't have a I don't have a sort of standard go to pitch. I, I will talk through some of them, um, um, some of the aspects, but it really is dependent on the case. Um, I'll say a couple of things that I think make us, um, uh, that make us somewhat unique. First, um, uh, if we start with the partnership itself, I, I think we bias towards having people with operational experience that have done something um, really meaningful on the uh, the operating side, like have operating experience that is relevant to the widest possible range of, um, uh, of, of companies. And so to give a couple of examples, um, you know, Bill Corin, who's on the early team, um, was the head of engineering at Google for almost a decade. He scaled the engineering org from, I think, you know, a few dozen people in the early days to probably tens of thousands by the time that he left. Uh, before that, he he led the the computer science division of Bell Labs. He is, uh, I mean, he's he's one of the most respected engineering leaders in the world. Um, and he's, you know, one of the one of the things we like to say at Sequoia is like, uh, when you get one of us, you get all of us. And that is, um, that sounds nice, but it is also true in reality. Bill probably helps a couple of dozen companies that he is not on the board of, that he did not lead an investment in, um, just because uh, that's the way that Bill is. And it's, you know, people really want Bill's advice when it comes to building and scaling engineering orgs. Uh, I'll give a couple other quick examples. Um, uh, Carl Eschenbach is uh, is one of our partners on the growth team. He was the president and COO at VMware. He scaled them from something like forty million in revenue to six billion. He is uh, an amazing go to market leader and an amazingly nice guy. Uh, and he probably helps fifty companies at Sequoia, even though he's only formally on the board of six or seven. Uh, Ruloff was the CFO that took PayPal public back twenty years ago. Alfred Lin was the chairman and COO at Zappos, uh, which was a Sequoia company that was acquired by Amazon, sort of, et cetera, et cetera. So first and foremost, we look for operators that have seen the highest, uh, like the highest scale possible so that they can really help people think through not just going from C to series A or series A to series B, but really becoming a public company and then becoming an enduring legendary public company. Um, Two, uh, we um, we have a pretty incredible network, uh, which is mostly a function of just the founders that we've been lucky enough to partner with over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I don't I don't know the exact stat. I always get this wrong, but I think something like twenty five. Uh, I think it's a little north of twenty five percent of the Nasdaq um, it, are Sequoia companies by by dollar value. Um, companies like Apple and Google and Cisco and Oracle and NVIDIA um, and ServiceNow and Zoom and Snowflake and the like. Um, and one of the things that's so powerful about that is, you know, we know the teams there. Like we backed Jensen at NVIDIA probably when I was in high school. Um, but folks like uh, Doug and Michael and others at Sequoia uh, still have those relationships. Um, and so I think our ability to really connect you with anyone in the world that you need to sort of unlock something in your business is, uh, is pretty, uh, is pretty unparalleled. Um, and so there, there are many other aspects. I, I won't, I won't use all of our time for that, but I think it's the mix of the people that we hire, the people in our network and, um, just the community of, uh, founders and execs and other folks that kind of want to help each other out. 
Of course. A few ones that I want to point out there uh, that you mentioned, just to make sure our audience really heard those. Um, so I love the point on collaboration. Um, that great quote that you gave, you know, you get one of us, you get all of us is really important. That's great value that uh, companies and founders can get from working with Sequoia. Of course, your network. Yes, totally agree. There are a lot of great companies that still want to give back uh, because they got so much from Sequoia. Uh, so that makes sense why you guys have built such a powerful network. And also that real life experience, the operating experience goes a long ways uh, because sometimes founders, as you mentioned earlier, I mean, they just want to know um, you know, the answer from experience, you know, like they want to talk to someone who was in their shoes not so long ago. Uh, so having that operating experience is really important as well, which makes sense why you guys have uh, built this uh, longer term relationship with the Sequoia Fund. Um, so I'm, I'd love for you to have some time to speak about the Sequoia Fund um, recent announcement again, you know, pushing more long term investments, uh, which is really restructuring VC as we've come to know it. Um, how excited are you about the new Sequoia Fund? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's very exciting. I think the um, we have always tried to take. Um, I think one thing that we have learned over time is that great companies just continue to compound. Like they continue to grow and grow and grow. Um, uh, if you take, I, I mentioned Nvidia earlier. Um, I think. I may get this wrong. I think we led the Series A in 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 NVIDIA. It might have been the Series A or the Series B. Um, and I, I don't have the, the dates off the top of my head, but I think the company went public in probably the mid to late 90s. And I have to imagine that when it went public, it was uh, worth less than a billion dollars. And I haven't looked at the current price, but my guess is NVIDIA is worth something like six or $700 billion right now. Um, so that's a lot of appreciation, like a six or 700 X, even over 20 years is a pretty phenomenal amount of growth. Um, and I, I think we've seen that just with a, um, a huge number of the companies we work with. Like if you take a company like ServiceNow or Square and you look at the value of the company when it went public and the value of the company today, it's not a difference of 2x or 3x. In many cases, it's a difference of 30x or 40x. Mm -hmm. And the reason I cite all of those is, I think for a whole variety of reasons, venture used to be oriented around the IPO being the quote unquote exit. And people people even talk about IPOs as, as again, quote unquote exits. And I think our experience is, great one, uh, great companies don't stop being great companies when they go public. And in many cases, like the companies can literally uh, excel for decades after they go public. Um, and I think the the traditional structure of VC provided a little bit of pressure to sort of say, well, you know, this is a company that uh, was founded 10 years ago. It went public five years ago. Like, at what point are you going to distribute this back? And I think we got much more leeway than the average VC firm because of, um, our relationships with our LPs and historical results and the like, but there was still this ex expectation at some point. You know the, um, you know the clock was. You know, twenty years seems like a long time to sort of hold a stock, and I think for some of the best companies that we are associated with, we think holding a, you know, being a shareholder, potentially remaining on the board for fifty years sounds pretty good. Like some of these companies, I think will be 50 year plus companies. Um, and so that, that was the real sort of impetus behind restructuring and the formation of the Sequoia Capital Fund. Of course, and I think that a lot of other funds are gonna follow in your footsteps. So uh, very interesting to hear about that, uh, Mike. Um, so before we um, move segments, I'd love to talk about uh, some of the past investments that you've made. You've made some wonderful investments in companies like Handshake, Citizen, Notion, Rippling. Uh, I'm curious of some trends uh, that you're very excited about um, or, you know, just some companies, um, uh, or I should say industries and sectors uh, that are really, really uh, bringing a lot of interest to you um, today. Yeah. Um, I, so I'd say there are a couple. Um, one, I think one thing I've been thinking about for a few years is what I would describe as SaaS sprawl, just like the the number of SaaS applications that anyone has, that any single company has. Like, I, I think we did an audit at some point. I heard this a couple of weeks ago. And I think at Sequoia, we have, we're paying for more distinct SaaS, uh, pieces of SaaS than we have employees, uh, which is not entirely unusual. Like, it, it's not crazy for um, 
a company of two or 300 people to have four, four or 500 pieces of SaaS. Um, and I think one of the perennial debates um, that we have internally when evaluating various sectors, and I was, I was talking to someone about this this weekend, is the kind of all-in-one versus best-of-breed strategy, um, where all-in-one is like you, you buy one system that does a lot of different things, and best-of-breed is you, you, you kind of want uh, a thing that does one thing really, really well, and then you're willing to piece these things together. Sure. Um, one, um, one trend that I am excited about is in the largest software categories, a swing back towards all-in-one. Um, it has to kind of be in the largest software categories, but that swing back. And that really explains in part our excitement around both Notion and Rippling. Like Notion, mm -hmm. um, I think Notion describes itself as an all-in-one workspace. And you know, uh, it's a wonderful business. The founders, are, um, the founders are amazing. But I think one of the things, one of the ways in that it is on the right side of history is that you have all of these different point solutions and data being siloed across all of these different applications. And Notion really gives you a single canvas upon which you can um, um, sort of integrate all of your data together, uh, see it in like a bunch of standard forms, whether it is, you know, in a table or in uh, or a doc or what have you, but also uh, now and over time sort of build your own applications on top of it. And I just think like, over time, Notion has the potential to um, maybe it starts out by knocking out three or four pieces of software you were you were buying, but over time, maybe it knocks out 10, 15, 20, 25, as it just becomes this kind of all-in-one workspace. Uh, and I think there's a very similar dynamic with Rippling, uh, which is kind of a unified HR and IT stack that um, is also a, a wonderful company that's doing very well and can a lot of the, uh, a lot of what Rippling is doing, Parker, the CEO of Rippling, talks about it as I think a compound startup. Uh, but part of the idea is uh, they have today probably a dozen different applications that run on top of the Rippling platform, and they're constantly launching more and more. And the idea is to just the more you can unify your HR and IT applications onto a single platform where everything works well with each other. Um, the, the more goodness that happens, like the simpler it is for end users, the more, um, uh, the better product experience you can build, et cetera. So I think that that notion of the pendulum swing, pendulum swinging back towards all in one in the largest software categories, I think is super interesting. Of course. Um, you know, people want things as simple as possible. I mean, speaking from the consumer um, side. So I love the points that you made there. And, uh, you know, we use Rippling and Notion internally at Inside. So I second Fantastic. everything that Mike said there. They're great companies. Um, so, Mike, now we're going to move on to a very fun segment that we do. It's our five minute favorite segment. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions. You do not need to think too much of the answers, but this is just going to allow our audience to learn a little bit more about what's going in, on uh, inside your head. Um, so we're going to start with the question. Uh, number one, uh, what is your favorite book? Uh, it's probably 100 Years of Solitude uh, uh, by uh, Garcia Marquez. It's a fantastic book if no one's read it. So. Awesome. Um, favorite Twitter follow? This can be someone inside VC or outside VC. Um, who's that one individual for you? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, well, Andrew Reid here at Sequoia is a pretty great Twitter follower. Um, I, I definitely follow a bunch of the like uh, mocking VC accounts of, of various kinds. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but I'll, I'll give it to you. I'll, uh, I'll give it to Andrew Reid for right now. Awesome. He's pretty good at Twitter. Follow him on as well. So wonderful follow. Um, favorite city to visit inside the U.S. Uh, it has to be New York. I, I grew up just outside New York, and New York's my favorite city in the world. Awesome. Love that. Uh, favorite podcast. Feel free to say this one. Uh, but if not, what's your favorite podcast? Um, you know, it, it, it evolves over time. Uh, probably the thing I probably listen to most right now is Planet Money. Um, mm -hmm. um, but it has evolved over time. So. Awesome. Uh, favorite food. Uh, favorite food. Um, probably... Um, I'm a sucker for Thai food, so probably Thai food. 
Same. <laughs> um, favorite piece of technology? Favorite piece of technology? Um, well, this is going to be a funny answer, but I, I like one of my weird hobbies is networking and Wi Fi and just like making sure that I have the fastest possible uh, networking setup. So um, I will say, uh, like, network switches and uh, Wi-Fi access points. So Awesome. Really exciting one. <laughs> First time we've heard that on the show. Uh, but no, that's great. Uh, favorite song, band, or artist? You can pick one of those. Uh, either Radiohead or The Beatles. Awesome. Uh, favorite TV show? Uh, all time, maybe... I mean, Sopranos is really good. The Wire was really good. I'll go with one of those. All right. So with these final two ones, uh, you can take a little extra time. doesn't have to be such a fast answer. Uh, I know guests usually like to think about it a little more. Uh, but favorite childhood memory? Favorite childhood memory? Um... I think the one uh, uh, the one that comes to mind, I I'll, I'll tell a very quick story about it, is when I was, and this is, uh, I think, on my Sequoia profile. When I was 11 years old, I went to a hockey game with my older brother, and we stopped by the Toys R Us in Herald Square, and there was a giant Lego display, and there was a competition to guess the number of blocks in the Lego display. And so as a weird 11-year-old, I sat there for 20 minutes and calculated it in my head. And that probably didn't have any effect, but I was like the closest one of every, of everyone who submitted. Uh, and so wow. I ended up winning a trip for me and my family to Denmark. Uh, but the strange thing wow. about this was, you know, I filled out like my, my actual name and my home phone number and my address on the little piece of paper you had to submit. Um, but I was 11 years old. And uh, for about two months, Lego kept trying to reach me. Um, so they would kept calling my house asking for me by name because that was the only name on the, the piece of paper. And my parents were very sketched out why was someone trying to talk to their 11-year-old son. So they kept hanging up on Lego. Um, and so finally, Lego uh, sent a certified mail a letter to our house. And at the time, what you had to do is you had to go to the post office and give them a little slip for them to give you the letter. And so I went with my mother and that was the first time that, uh, so she opened the letter and she finally believed that Lego was actually trying to get in contact with her. Uh, and so I, I remember the trip to the post office because uh, it was the first time she told me that Lego had been trying to get in contact with me for two months. And uh, I know wow. it's fun as an 11 year old for Lego to be trying to reach you, so. That is amazing. A lot of cool lessons in there, but uh, do you think you could do it again? Could you guess the number? <laughs> no, I think it was dumb luck. Um, <laughs> That's awesome, though. That's, that's a great story. Um, so, Mike, our final question for you on 5-Minute Favorites. Uh, favorite piece of advice? This could be a piece of advice that you give to others or a piece of advice that you've gotten from someone else, or um, it could be one of each. But favorite piece of advice? Um, I can think of a few, but I'll pick one. And I got this advice from a guy named Dave Treadwell, who was a VP at Microsoft, and now he's uh, he's he's part of the leadership team at Amazon. And it was a couple of years into my time at Microsoft, and uh, and the advice was basically always like, um, always. Um, I'm trying to think the exact articulation. Um, always assume your coworkers are smart and well intentioned, uh, and. I think it's like a very simple piece of advice, but I think especially as you get into like larger and larger companies, it's easy to um, it's easy to think that, oh, that person over there is an idiot or that person over there is doing this thing and I don't like it. And it's because they have they're trying to do this. They're, they're you know, they either they have bad intentions or they're dumb or both. And I think uh, I think for organizational cultures in general, if you have this starting point of like, always just assume that the people you work with are smart and well-intentioned, then if something happens that um, doesn't match your mental model, that somehow like you interpret in a bad way, if you assume, if you, if you stop yourself and think, 
well, okay, this person is smart and they're well intentioned, so there must be some mis there must be some misunderstanding here. So let me go debug the misunderstanding versus, or that person is an idiot. I think it's like a much healthier culture in general. So. That's wonderful advice. Very well put, Mike. Thank you so much for that. Um, let's move on to audience Q&A. We have some great questions that came in from a few of our uh, listeners. Um, first, we'll go to Ian. Um, does Sequoia only look for the next unicorn, or is it a strong niche player attractive to, or is a strong niche player attractive to, assuming it solves a real problem? Uh, good question. I, I think we... Um, uh, we have a strong bias around market size. Um, and so we are, um, we are looking, you know, our, our general, if I had to distill down our thesis uh, entirely, I would say in any given year around the world, there's a small number of companies that will be founded that will become uh, enduring public companies companies like apple or google or nvidia or cisco and our job is to um, find them as early as possible and work with them as long as possible and so if, if we think a company if we think a company is going to be a great small company um, that can be an incredible company for the founders and for the employees and for everyone it's probably not a fit for us like the thing that we are looking for uh, are the companies that will be uh, companies that thrive for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Of course. Thank you for answering that. Um, a question um, came in as well about the scout program that you guys have. Um, first off, thanks for doing this, Mike. What do you look for when you are picking the next top scout for Sequoia? Uh, of course, uh, famous Sequoia scout, Jason Calacanis is a huge inspiration. Ha. Um yeah, I, I would say there's some element of um, I think someone that we uh, uh, usually it's someone that we have some connection with. So there's some base level of trust. Um, it's ideally someone that has a unique vantage point on a network or a geography or the like. Um, you know, we, we have some. Uh, we have some scouts in Europe, we have some scouts in LATAM, we have some scouts here in the US in various different cities. Um, and someone that we think has great judgment. So ideally, it's someone that is going to intersect with really interesting founders and is pretty good at picking out the exceptional founders from the very good ones. Of course. No, that's very well said. Um, so thank you so much for that question, Nipun. Um, And final audience question we'll have come in. Thank you so much, of course, Mike, for doing this. Love how kind you guys are being today. Um, what, not to say that you guys haven't been kind in the past, but thank you so much for acknowledging uh, Mike's time here. Really appreciate it. Uh, what degree of speed to scale are you looking for in a new startup? In other words, when is something too fast? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and my like view on this has evolved over time. Um, I think I think tempo is like one of the most important variables, maybe the most important variable, mm -hmm. especially in the early days, um, to a company's success. Like people who just, you know, there are some companies where something takes a week and other companies where it takes a day. And generally the company where the same thing takes a day is going to out-execute the um the, the, the company where something takes a week, every day of the week. Um, and so I think tempo is super important. I think sometimes people confuse tempo for this, this notion of like blitz scaling or getting as big as possible, as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. I am not a fan personally of, um, I, I'm not a fan of uncontrolled growth, by which I mean, just like throwing a lot of money at the problem and scaling, especially if you have negative, either like negative unit economics or negative contribution margin without a plan to sort of having it be uh, strong. So I care a lot about tempo, but I also care a lot about discipline. Um, so I think discipline speed uh, is fantastic. And I think is generally what, what one should aspire for. 
Of course, discipline and tempo are also tied into focus, something that you've spoken a lot about today. So I think that that's a wonderful point and great question. Uh, thank you so much to our audience member for that. Uh, Mike, I just want to say thank you so much for spending time on venturing in VC. I know you have a very busy schedule, but you made time for us to share your best advice, to share uh, information about your journey, and of course, the value that Sequoia brings to founders. So thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Of course. Uh, before we close out, I want to say again, thank you so much to our sponsor for season one, Seed Invest. Uh, you can learn more about how to get your business in front of their network of over 600,000 investors looking for opportunities at inside.seedinvest.com. Also, the podcast version of today's episode will be going live Thursday morning, very early. I know you guys enjoyed this one so much, so please make sure to post about it, share about it, and um, listen. I'm going to be re-listening re re to this a few times. Mike had a lot of great advice. Um, and also, you can sign up for episode 10 of Venturing in VC at inside.com slash VIVC to get a very exclusive look at next week's guest. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>